evening. evening. We still have people coming, but we're going to go ahead and start. It's one of our compassionate efforts to respect the time um, that you have given and that you have come on time, and we're going to start on time. But I'm going to go over just some housekeeping things, which might give people a little more time to get here, right? So um, the bathrooms, right? Um, they're right below us. There is an elevator that way, and there's stairs this way, okay? There's also water fountains out in the hall there, and I did bring some um, cups, so if you get thirsty, you can go and do that as well. Um, my name is Ann Helmke, and I'm the faith li liaison for the city of San Antonio. And tonight is actually part two. Uh, we did a pilot to kind of test this in May, and it was called Shortening the Line. And we brought together nonprofits, and we discussed about how can we work so that the line of need becomes shorter. And we had a really good response. And so um, that pilot, so I don't know whether we call this two or number one, but we're like officially beginning now with minding the gaps. What are those gaps in terms of economic segregation, um, those things that are happening that we need to be looking at? Um, and we have three more then coming up. We have these once a season whenever there's a fifth Tuesday, except in December because it doesn't work this year. So it will be January 7th. But I'm going to give you those dates and those topics at the end of tonight. Derek, could you go ahead and pull up that PowerPoint, the Minding the Gaps one? So... Um, While we're, well, no, I'm going to go ahead and enter. Look how larger than life you are, Tommy. <laughs> I mean, like, right. So uh, I'm, you've all been, like, reading in Eventbrite, and I was just telling our conversation starters. Um, so I hope that uh, the carver doesn't hear this, but we have 175 reservations tonight and 140 seats. So hopefully that'll work. I think it will. Because um, there's always some attrition. Uh, but we had over 1,400 people or click ins into the actual invitation, which is pretty phenomenal that, that there is this desire to have a conversation around poverty and tonight in particular on economic segregation. So, our conversation starters tonight Tommy Calvert, um, homegrown commish, and, but he works you know, kind of globally, he's larger than life, and um, we're just grateful that you're here tonight to share. And Linda is as beautiful as a rose, and I didn't get a picture of her. So, this is a, a placeholder, but Linda's going to wave her hand. Linda, is somebody new I've just met. She's retired military. She's a minister and she's a community health outreach worker with Metropolitan Health. So she brings just a real richness to this conversation and you know really being with people and you know just extraordinary background. Yay! And then Christine Drennan, I'm hoping that many of you have heard her before or that you watched the video when you might have gotten the information sent out. A really great, more than primer, a really great in-depth look at um, our geography and demographics and um, a brilliant woman. And so I'm, thank you, Christine. She saved me the other day. I was on TPR and it was going south. And she called in and I'm like, thank you, Christine. Yeah, I know. And then there's this crazy guy, Andrew Hill, who kind of hangs out doing compassionate San Antonio work, associate prof professor at St. Phillips, and you probably have heard about this amazing thing that they're doing with high school graduates, so they get to college, so he might share some of that. Um, but he does a lot with peace work, <laughs> Ireland, all over the world. Did some sort of crazy thing, like a fellowship or something last year with Stanford, and anyway. We tease me about that. And then we have Simone here from Good Samaritan Center. I hope some folks are familiar with Good Samaritan Center. Woo! Yes. I went and visited it in seminary 30 years ago, and it changed my life. Um, just because of the work that they were doing in terms of community capacity and helping folks right there in the neighborhood. So he comes with that capacity building. It's faith-based, been at it. How many years now is Good Sam 
uh, bueno, 69 years. So, you know, they've got experience behind it. And then we have, I'm, I know my computer is about to die. Okay, good. We can do that. And then there's, a, you can just take that bag and you can find several in there, I'm sure. Hang on, man. That's Derek. He's making all this happen tonight. Yay, Derek. So Veronica Soto is the director of the Neighborhood Housing Services Department with the city. And I wish that we had time for her to tell her story even, along with the work that they're doing. Uh, amazing woman, amazing background. So uh, all of these are like possible speakers to come. But that whole fair housing, uh, affordable housing, they're working on that and neighborhoods working together. So we've got some really good conversation starters. So thank you. Now, um, how this works, um, we have three questions. And um, we'll ask one question, and it'll be up here so you don't totally have to remember it. I know how that is in conversation. You're going like, what was that question again? You know, but it'll be up here. And our conversation starters will, will converse. And we're all going to be listening in, right? And that's really kind of the challenge for the six people up here, because they'll want to do other things, but they're going to talk to each other and we're all going to listen in. And then you all are going to get an opportunity to continue that conversation right after this moment. Because now I'm going to invite you to stand up and find two people you've never talked to before. And then find another place to sit down with them. Okay, get up. Two people you've never talked to before. See, now you get to breathe a little bit. You know, it's a very interesting time of year for us to be gathering. We're right in the middle of Diwali, which is the Hindu festival of lights. Uh huh. We're, we're right in that. Um, and then, of course, there's All Hallows Eve. And depending your take on it, mine is that, you know, God gets the last laugh and Darkness just doesn't get light. But that's my take on All Hallows Eve. And then the next day, we have All Saints Day, where we honor and remember all those who have gone before us. And we wouldn't be in this room without all those who have gone before us, right? And then there's, so San Antonio, and not just San Antonio, right? But then there's Day of the Dead, right? Where we remember and we spend time together and... So it's an extraordinary time for us to gather and try to shed some light in this time of dark and light, but shed some light on our complicity when it comes to economic segregation and poverty, our complicity, but it also can hopefully tonight bear some light on our capacity to change things and move them around. So our first question for our conversation starters and for the room. From your particular vantage point, the work that you do, the things that you know, your vantage point also includes like if you're a parent or if you're, I mean, your neighbor, your other things. We all have vantage points. From your particular vantage point, why is this conversation on economic segregation so critical? And do you have a story or a stat to validate that? Is there something behind why you think that's critical? So I'm going to pass this to our conversation starters. Does anybody have a thought? Go, Linda. Again, my name is Linda Carmen Bryant. Um, my vantage point is as a community health worker and as I think about um, segregation in regards to economics, I think that from a health perspective, a part of the healthy neighborhoods is which we're promoting in the, under the city, is that when we talk about uh, economic status of the people within the community, and when they have issues with their finances, that tends to wear on their, their body. And it causes health issues. And, and so from that regard, it makes a difference in their, in their lives because that impacts their health. And on top of that, when you talk about being able to go out and make purchases of healthy items, healthy foods, or being 
having healthy foods available for them in this community, those things are not existent here as they are in other portions of the city. And so when we talk about being able to purchase items, the places they have to go in order to get it, they have to pay a higher cost for it. And therefore, that causes problems within their homes and within the community. And then having those available resources here in the community are kind of not as, as available as they are in others. And so it causes them to have to, trans, you know, for transportation, having to go outside of where they live and being able to have to pay higher costs for the things that they're trying to purchase. So I think twofold as it pertains to their health and as it pertains to the availability of being able to make the purchase of those items that make a difference in their, in their health. So what I'd like to say is I start with a story. And it's a story of somebody who grew up around the Good Samaritan area, around the Cassiano homes. And I was talking to her about six months ago. She was there at a barbecue that was being held. And she said, I really am grateful for the work that you all do at Good Samaritan because 40 years ago, I got a scholarship from the board to go to school. She went to St. Philip's and she became a nurse. And she talked about the changes that it made in her life, which is she went to school, she finished, she had a career, she was now retired and was a member of the senior center. But what it changed for her is her kids went to college. Her kids were more educated. Her kids had access to other things. So when you talk about economic segregation, I think it's really giving people the tools to live in dignity, and that is being able to do for themselves. And so that's just one example, and I think there's many others, of somebody who was given the tools, offered that opportunity, and had access to education, to uh, a better life, to own a home, to now retire and have savings and to come back and say thank you. So uh, that ability to live in dignity, I think is really, really important in terms of how we view uh, moving up and what we can do for our kids and our other neighbors in the city. Okay, I'll take a turn. Is it on? Are we on? Yeah. Um, economic segregation, right, is, um, and following, following the two of you, um, really about uneven opportunity. And that the, 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 where you live really does determine a lot of the opportunity that's, that's, that's available to you. And so we heard about it in health, and, in, in, and we know it's in education because we go to school through where we live historically. Um, and I don't, you can, you can nudge me if I take us off off track a little bit, but I get troubled by the conversations that, that we often have that puts things like our, the economic segregation in this city and the poverty levels at, um, on our shoulders that say, well, you know, uh, we don't have enough parent involvement in school and that's why our families are so poor and so, it, so it's, a, it's, it's on parents and I, in and, and that's why, you know, you're stuck in that neighborhood because you you're not involved. And that really, really troubles me because, uh, and, and I'm going to do this as, as an academic, right? You have a wonderful story. I have a statistic. <laughs> We're the most economically segregated in, city in the country. And the biggest question to me that, that I think we should ask ourselves is why here? And is it because we're bad parents? And I don't think so. I think we're phenomenal parents. When I watch parents, they're, they're just the best parents in the whole world. So it's not our parenting is the reason why we're so economically segregated and now our poverty numbers are high. There's something deep, much more deep and scary to this than, than that. And that I really want to have that conversation and shift it away from this thing on on, yeah, sure, there's, you know, there is some personal responsibility involved in how well people do, but not to this extent, not to, not to the point where we are the most economically segregated and now the highest poverty city in the country. Um, we need to take that and, and have a serious conversation about, about governing and about economics and about what we can do that makes us so vulnerable to these horrible things that are happening at, at state and federal levels that are hitting us and making us poorer. Thank you. Um, 
I like what uh, Christine said about it not being on our shoulders because from my vantage point, um, and I'll speak to two, one vantage point is as the director of a department that addresses housing issues and affordable housing in particular, I do feel that some in our community do put that on, on our shoulders and you know, being the leader in the department, I'm like, oh my God, this is heavy to carry <laughs> uh, because only in the last couple of years, and, and part of it is thanks to Dr. Drennan's work on looking at equity in our community, have we started to put more resources on affordable housing. Guess what? One or two years of investing more is not gonna solve 80 years worth of inequity. But there's still an expectation that you're gonna fix it. You've been here two and a half years, why isn't it fixed? <laughs> And so that putting it on our shoulders is one of the things that I think is part of the conversation that we all need to collectively say it's on all of our shoulders. It's not just the city, it's a combination of different partners that one entity by itself can solve it. And not only that, but one entity with a little bit more money by itself can solve it. So it's about partners and addressing many systemic things, but also addressing this investment that local elected officials have made in the past. Uh, and so acknowledging that is important. The second vantage po point for me is as a mom, you know. Everything I do, I'm not spending time with my kids tonight so I can be here with you because this conversation is important. That's something I told my kids this morning. I'm going to be home late. Give me my hug this morning because this conversation is important because I want my kids to have the best they, that I can offer them, but I don't want only my kids to have the best that I can offer them. I want all the kids here to have the best that can be offered to them. So a story. Um, I didn't grow up advantaged. I didn't grow up knowing I was going to go to college. Um, but my mom believed in me. She was a great parent, um, very low income, seamstress all her life. But she told me I was smart. And I believed her, Linda. And, and so I said, I'm smart. I'm, I'm going to do the best. I'm an immigrant. I didn't speak English until fourth grade. And even then, my accent still comes out when I get nervous. So if it comes out, Forgive me, but it's, it's the nerves. Um, and, and she said, you know, this is the land of opportunity, so if you work hard, there'll be an opportunity. And I believed her, because who doesn't believe their mom who works really hard? And so because of, of that belief in me that she had and teachers had, and because she told me that we moved here for opportunity, we, you know, we moved to this country because there's opportunity, I thought I better make the most of it because she gave up her family, her, her life uh, for me and for my siblings. And so I did get wonderful scholarships um, because again, I believed this, there's opportunity and I didn't wanna let her down. Um, and so it, it didn't matter that I didn't speak English as a child and it didn't matter that I was poor because I knew someone else would believe in me like my mom did, like my teachers did. And I think every child should be believed in. And so just like I had this great opportunity and I ended up going to Ivy League schools, I don't think the zip code or the poverty matters, I think every child can be Ivy League material if you believe in them. That's what I tell my kids. No pressure on them, right? Uh -huh. Poor kids. Um, but I believe in them. And I tell them, if you apply yourself, the opportunity will be in front of you. You just have to go for the opportunity. But I think any kid in any zip code should also have someone believe in them. Um, their parents, their school teachers, the bureaucrats like me, we should believe in them. And we should tell them, just because you're poor doesn't mean you can't go to college. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you can't be an elected official. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you can be the head of an agency. And so if we tell them that long enough, I think that's one of the ways that we can address this segregation and this poverty issue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit of a story. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, my name is Andy Hill, and I I want to come back to the question you were raising a, a minute ago about why is this the case? If we're the not just the poorest, but the most segregated, what's the 
The root of that, now I get, like many of the people that are here, I watched the video and assigned us as our homework. And, uh, and it was so fascinating to have you kind of unpack slowly the history of the dozens of school districts that get consolidated and how that kind of this dance of who's going to match up with who and then who's going to get left at the bottom, Edgewood, who's going to be left alone at the top, Alamo Heights, because they don't want anybody else. And it was, it was just absolutely fascinating to see how the consolidation took shape over these years and why we ended up with these crazy geographical patterns that we have. And I thought that was an insight into the history. But I guess I'm assuming that we have to understand the history if we're going to have answers to the future and future public policy and where we go in terms of direction. So I just wanted to come back to that and say that history is really interesting and I do think it's important to shaping the future, but do you have suggestions or ideas about how do we address the segregation? That's question number two. Oh, okay, I'm jumping ahead apparently. <laughs> Hear what Tommy has to say. So, uh, you know, uh, many years ago when we were uh, fighting for uh, contracting at the city of San Antonio, I was looking at what I believed was economic apartheid here in San Antonio, mm -hmm. just by definition. And many people thought I was pretty radical for that, but go to the dictionary yeah. and you'll find San Antonio, to be perfectly honest. So I think this, this question for me um, is, why is why is it important from my vantage point and it's it's I'm gonna say it in my capacity as an elected official but it's just my capacity as a human okay uh, I believe it's important for us to discuss this because uh, we want everybody to live up to their potential at least I, I I don't know if everybody shares that but I certainly want everybody to live up to their potential um, and conversely when people don't live up to their potential there is a lot of pain there is a lot of suffering. There are a lot of setbacks uh, that happen. And poverty can be some hard uh, roadblocks in the road of living up to your potential. And as a leader, uh, you know, people, we want to help people get to the most prosperous place they can possibly get to. And so, on one hand, as a selfishness to the importance of the conversation, if, if, if we make it work better, if we become less segregated, my job becomes easier. I remember when I used to, I was a deputy council person at City Hall, and so I worked for Mario Salas in District 2, and I was uh, 17 years old. It's technically illegal for me to have the job, but we're past the statute of limitations. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't eat lunch until 3 o'clock because my phone was ringing off the hook with complaints and things people needed. But the District 10 person, which I now represent probably as well, District 2 and District 10, uh, they, they, they didn't have the kind of calls and um, the kind of burden that, and they could take lunch. And they actually gave me a calendar book and said, well, you need this. You, you need some extra note paper. You're working your Rudy Tootie fresh and fruity off. So. Um, there is, there is a multi-level toll, and I think this is an important conversation because San Antonio likes to sweep its truths under the rug and not deal with its truths. And the truths go back even further than 80 years. The truths go back to the time of land being stolen from the Latino population, the Native American population, and to me, the community, because we are in an apartheid system, the, the, the leadership, the established leadership, they have to put a veneer that everything is okay. Don't remind folks that land was stolen and that as a result wealth was not built because what is the thing that creates the most wealth? Ownership of property and land. And so when people were pushed away from that ability and they're the majority of the population, that is a raw scab that has never been dealt with. But we will never be who we're supposed to be until we help rid this terrible stain on our history. So this, to me, um, has manifested itself into so many things, whether it in the education system, we now have 25% of our adult population that reads at a fifth grade level. Um, I had been warning my colleagues on Commissioner's Court and at City Hall that 
home ownership rates would go down. I was right. They went from 54% to 51%. I have been telling colleagues that you have 40% of Hispanics in some school districts dropping out, 50% of blacks in some school districts dropping out, and that's going to come home to roost. 20% poverty increase, most segregated city. I told you so. And so uh, we need to be talking about this as a community because we are not going to get where we need to be unless we deal with our reality. And we don't like to do that in San Antonio. So why don't we deal with a little more reality? So I'm going to invite your triads now to continue that same conversation. Just pick it up, the same question. We're going to do that for about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we can all start coming back together for another round of of conversation and connection. As we move on to question two. So, you know, Andy kind of like moved ahead because that's kind of what we do when we start to have these conversations. So what are we going to do about that? I uh, recently, and maybe others have, sometimes I'm, you know, slow like on social media and things, but I, I heard two terms put together that I hadn't heard before. Bystander, I'd heard that before, um, but the one I hadn't heard was upstander. So, you know, like how do we move from some of the, you know, this kind of conversation and what those gaps are and what the needs are and, and what the systemic problems are and, and then Andy said, but you know, like what can we do about that? How do we move from maybe being overwhelmed by it so we don't move and we're a bystander or, uh, I don't know, we, you know, how do we move? to actually stand up and, and start to do something about it. So the next question, too, is from the conversation that you've been having, and I don't know if you saw these folks up here, but they were in conversation. So that we're all going to cheer them on that they get back into that conversation. But from your conversation that you've had so far, what might this information tell us and mean for us as a community? Do you have a specific idea or example of something that is already happening or something that needs to happen? Okay. So I have an idea. We had, he has a, an idea. we had a great conversation. Um, and on that first question, what might this information tell us and mean for us as a community? I mean, I think what it means for me is that all choices are intentional. And so, Tommy, you were talking about conversations you've had at Commissioner's Court and trying to win favor for this policy directive or the other. And the... That was off the record. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I see these conversations taking place at that level. And, and you sometimes wonder, well, why did they make that decision? And that's because somebody made that decision and five people or three people decided this is the way to go. So it's always intentional and it always helps somebody and it always hurts somebody. So it's incumbent upon us to make our voices known. So all those choices are intentional. If they're bad, they were intentional. If they were good, they're intentional. And so I think one example of something that, that I think uh, symbolizes this, you know, you've talked about redlining in the past and you know, the effects of that in San Antonio. And we had this conversation about two years ago. I talked to you for like two minutes and I said, we have to th start thinking about things as how do we green line things, right? we have to talk about greenlining. And so I mentioned to you the example of what happened when land was donated for UTSA. And that was a long time ago. And look at what happened as a result of that greenlining. And so I'm gonna set Andy up here. I think one example of greenlining is Alamo Promise. Um, I was talking to two chancellors ago of the Alamo Colleges, and I mentioned to him about 15 years ago, I said, why don't you just offer free tuition? You know, it, I think it would like really, it would make things so much better because students struggle even today. And he said, I want to keep my job. <laughs> if, I, if, if I suggest that, they're going to think that that's a crazy idea. So 
I think that's an example of green lining. And I agree that the Alamo Promise is... Maybe we should tell people what it is. Yeah. So maybe some people don't. Yeah. yeah. And again, this is a small pilot program which began a year ago, was expanded this year to identify particular high schools where the promise is if you graduate from this local high school, you can attend one of the five community colleges in the Alamo College District um, with no tuition. So free at the point of delivery. It's obviously going to cost a lot of money, but we're going to find ways to get those resources and to provide them for our students and especially for underserved students. I think that it it does have the potential to be transformative for our communities. And I know that uh, I heard directly from the mayor last month that this is a giant priority for him and his agenda. Uh, Dr. Michael Flores, the chancellor now, is a great proponent of it, a champion of it, and he's finding ways to make it work and to hopefully to continue to expand it. It's going to be disruptive in terms of the funding and how we provide uh, higher education at the community college level in San Antonio. It's going to take deep partnerships. It's going to have to have people change their priorities. Um, but to date myself, I'll tell you a quick story, which was that when I was a philosophy student at St. Mary's University years ago, uh, our professor was trying to teach us a story about values. And this is the dating part. He says, pull out your checkbooks. <laughs> and, uh, and I actually had a checkbook, and I pulled it out. And, uh, and he just said, look, go through, in class, I want you to sit and go through and look at what you're spending money on, because that's a reflection of your values. And I got to tell you, there was part of that which made me proud, part of it, which made me really embarrassed. And I thought to myself, wow, he's really right. I got to think about this. But for the colleges, for our communities, for our government, for every aspect of this, we have to remember that our budgets are a reflection of our values. And again, that's what I like so much about Alamo Promise. It says, this is what we value. So we're going to be leaning hard on a lot of our partners because these things are interrelated. And we've been talking about how health and education and all property, all of this is, is wound together. So we're going to be looking to all of you for help with this. But I do think it could be, I hope it's something we can continue to expand because I do think the mayor's right when he talks about the importance of it to the city. He described it as, you know, our moonshot. And I, I think he's right. So one of the things that happened in 2013, the Federal Reserve Board wrote a report in San Antonio, and they said in 2013 that San Antonio has one of the best economies in the nation, but it is unsustainable if it doesn't do something about its chronic undereducation. And so that has come home to roost in the poverty rates increasing, in the information technology economy when you need more knowledge in order to get a job and when you have more global competition. So the Rotary Foundation sent me to India to live and study business and, and study culture. And when I was in a classroom in India, I would ask the children, what do you want to be? And every one of the children in classrooms twice the size would go, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor. In America, that conversation is not as clear. Uh, we have a lot of students really unsure about <laughs> what they're going to do. and and, and that's because in India, you may have eight children, and one of them, they're able to save up and send to a private best school. They become an engineer or doctor, and then they take four more of the next generation and pay for their, their, their private school tuition, and they succeed. And so in the future, the reason this conversation is important is because out of the next recession, which I think will hit around 2021, San Antonio is not going to fare as well 
in that next recession as we did in the last one for a variety of reasons. One, state government is limiting the, the stimulating power of local government by capping our revenue. So, for example, we created 16,000 good paying construction jobs in the flood control programs the county did, $500 million between 2007 and 2017. And you know what happened? A recession, the Great Recession happened. But we were able to kind of just write it out a lot better because we had stimulated those good paying middle class construction jobs. We have no such thing on the horizon, although I think the housing bond would be the perfect thing because you get a seven to one uh, multiplier effect when you invest in housing. Um, so w w why, why is this conversation so important and what do we need to do about it? We better get busy, very busy, because when you have, you know, uh, 20 plus percent, 25 percent of your adult population that reads at a fifth grade level, what does that mean? That means that they discourage uh, that they're economically struggling, they discourage the child from going to Alamo College District because they say, or college in general, because they say we can't afford it, even though we know there's federal aid and, and hopefully we do a good job of marketing uh, that there will be free college tuition or job training. Um, but it means that home ownership rates go down, neighborhoods potentially suffer because renters don't keep up the uh, home quite as well as an owner does. It means people are what I call rent bondage. They're paying 50% or more of their income so that they can never pay for the down payment for a home. It means that people may sell drugs to make ends meet, right? This economic segregation is huge. We could be an incredibly depressed economy, uh, particularly out of the next recession, particularly as businesses don't have to be in the United States to operate anymore. As robots, 25% to 43% of the jobs we have today will be replaced by a computer or robot. So what do we need to do about it? Our schools, our high schools need to have CompTIA, Network Plus, Security Plus, the basic IT courses have to be in, and we need to teach people how to fix the robot, right? We have to completely transition out of the industrial economy, which we're still in with grade levels, and get into the knowledge and information sharing technology, which is part of what we're doing here, completely reform the classroom, and completely reform the priorities of the elected officials, to be, to be very honest. I'm going to do a teacher thing. <laughs> because what, what, what these three folks have just said, I, what I, all I want to do is take it and talk about the Alamo Promise especially. But like, we're talking about Alamo Promise, talking about education, but we're, all, but we're also talking about segregation. Right, and so I, so all I want to do is say, what? Well, how does this like? Let's let's put those together. Like, why are we why are we talking about Alamo Promise when Anne had said you're supposed to talk about segregation? And here's why I think why. When we think about the economic segregation, segregation is a geographic term. It means somebody lives there, and somebody else who's very different lives way over there. And what, what's that got to do with Alamo Promise? Right, like that's got to do with geography. But here's, it has to do with it when we start to talk about, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this segregation that we, I think we agree that this is, this is a bad thing, right? And there's different approaches to it. There's different approaches, right? There's pro approaches that say, well, we need, to, we need to pour money into those communities, right? Better roads, better, you know, better blah, 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 and which, is, which is partially true. But the, but the other, the flip side is, we also have to pour resources into the people. And if we pour resources in, into the people, then they can make good decisions about their own home, um, about buying a home. Because if we just think about pouring money into places, we're, we are at serious risk of a lot of displacement in this city right now. There's a lot of really vulnerable people in vulnerable neighborhoods. And actually, when we were having this little conversation up here, and 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 and, uh, and Veronica had said, "Well, that can lead to flight." But if you, if we think about it right now, what's going on in our inner city neighborhoods? Those are, that's really valuable property. And if people just had the education that they need to have a good job, then they can start to invest in their own home, right? And maybe make it a little bit bigger or a little stronger, and stay put. Right, so it's like, where do we put a li the limited amount of money? Can I, I forgot to mention one last thing. This will be the only time I do this twice. The, the reason this is so important is also to the fabric of this country. Because the debate we have over xenophobia, where the new Mason-Dixon line is between America and Latin America, 
the racial segregation, um, that conversation is about economic anxiety. People have a fear that an immigrant is going to take their job or someone who is different than them ethnically. And so what we need to be doing is, is, is telling people the truth, that technology is actually the number one reason that your job is being changed, outsourced, uh, and it's not immigrants and xenophobia that you should ride on. It is transitioning you to be able to uh, program that computer or, f or, or fix that robot. And my party, the Democratic Party, frankly, has missed the opportunity to talk about massive job retraining programs. If I were running for president, that's all I'd be talking about. Let's transition people out of the industrial economy into the new information technology economy and stop scapegoating Mexicans, okay? As the reason that we're losing jobs. So this is why this conversation is so important. So I'm gonna take it back to the work I do um, because all of these kind of conversations are important and I think now talking about um, more access to education, people have been having these conversations. It's just more palatable to talk about that. I mean, even the candidates running for president are saying, you know, free college. Um, 15 years ago, you're right, someone would have been fired. But when it comes to my, my work in housing, um, investing in places and investing in people go hand in hand. And so part of my job is to convince the audience here and 10 times or 100 times the audience here that the legislative kind of ideas that we're promoting to protect those neighborhoods um, need to be supported. And a lot of it is education. So, so part of my department's work is creating the kind of tools that can help protect areas that are being invested in and also keep people in place because there is the, the fear that if we invest in an area, the people who were there are not gonna benefit from it. So I need to convince everyone in this room and 100 people uh, like you outside of this room that these legislative changes that our department's gonna be proposing in the next few months are important and need to be in place. So that's part of one of the things I need to do. One of the other things, um, Tommy reminded me, um, I need your support, guys. Uh, we as, at the city need your support because we need a housing bond. And to get there, we need two things. So I'm signing you all up right now. We need to send um, a, a clear message that our city charger needs to, uh, needs to be changed. Currently, the city of San Antonio doesn't allow um, it's bond to be used for housing unless we go through this convoluted urban renewal authority, which is very bureaucratic, very convoluted, very limiting. So we can't do enough of what needs to be done in the community. So first we need to send that message that the city charter needs to be changed and you all signed up when you came here. And then the second thing, uh, you'll be uh, knocking on doors pretty soon, but the second thing is we do need a housing bond. Um, and it's, it's to address housing and to address investing in people and investing in places and to have more flexibility about the kind of programs that we can address. And it's also gonna be a jobs uh, creator. It, it will be something that helps our community overall. So those are the things I'm thinking of. And every year I you know, choose one big thing to work on. My big thing that I need to get community around that is gonna be that city charter. Um, for next year. So you're gonna hear a lot about it, but again, it's gonna end up being an election at some point, so it can't be a city bureaucrat that's the champion. You all need to be the champions. So that's one thing we can do, um, because it will address the housing issues, which addresses that um, economic segregation as well. And I think in regards to health, why is it significant? when, and some may have direct impact for health, but again, when we talk about our issues, our issues that stresses us impact our health. But one of the things I think in regards to uh, pouring money into the people, uh, pour, pouring money into the families, I think that it's important that we provide a level playing field for the people. And, and what I mean by that is, while the rules may be the same, but the process in which it takes is not. 
And so for some, it may be easier for them to get the funding, but for others, it's, it's, it's convoluted. And so we have to make sure that the process is equal and fair across the board for all individuals. One of the other things that I, that as you look at it from a health perspective, when we talk about funding and people being able to, to afford medications, and people are making decisions whether or not they're gonna eat or whether they're gonna purchase meds. And so having a funding opportunity where we are allowing them to purchase medications, if that be the case, that it's not at this high cost to get pills. Uh, and for me, I think it's, that's more of a secondary because I think primarily we need to look at options that are more holistic that we can um, prescribe to those who are, are suffering from whatever those chronic diseases may be. There are other options other than firstly saying, hey, take this pill. Um, as a part of the military, when, we would, when I would go because I might have injured myself in a, a sport event, and the first thing they'll say, if you say I have a swollen ankle or a pain here, they first thing they do is take these Motrin's, go and you take this for a period of time. And so the first thing they do is give you a med that's gonna, you know, whether it be for inflammation versus, you know, trying some something different, turmeric or some other types of things that can still give you that same benefactor that those pills can give you, but more from a holistic perspective. And so I think we have to make sure that we educate one another and do the right thing and not do all this synthetic type of meds versus trying to do things at a higher cost that's not necessarily good for the body. So I think when we throw monies into things, we need to throw monies into perspectives that's really gonna make a difference for the people and their bodies and their health so that they can do in turn do what we're talking about here to make a difference in their communities. So these folks are gonna keep on talking. And now you're going to continue the conversation in your triads for about 15 minutes. Same question. So, this last week, I haven't moved it yet. This last week, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, Keith, he's here in this room, he's still busy talking, but um, I was trying to come up with a metaphor and uh, we're kind of the work we're, we're trying to do through this whole process because we've got three more conversations coming, you know, like what are we trying to do, right? And um, so the one we're working on are, is building bridges because we're talking about gaps, maybe that's a metaphor, but Keith said, well, you do, you do know how they, they build bridges when they have very little materials to build bridges with. And he asked it just like that, right? And I'm like, no, I don't, you know. Because <laughs> right, you do know, right? I don't know. But, um, and as Keith told me, he said, what, what, when you have limited, and they used to build bridges by them, you know, on their own, on their hands, you know, they would shoot an arrow with a string on it across the gap and then somebody would be over there, and they would then tie on whatever the next heaviest thing is, like the rope, to that string, and then they pull it across. And they just keep shooting arrows and strings and ropes and cables, and then you've got all those working together until you have that strong foundation, right? So part of, I think, what we're doing tonight, especially in the next question, is about shooting those arrows. So we've already kind of talked a little, you know, what are, what, what are some ideas? What are some things that are happening? You know, shooting those arrows across. So um, our next question is about that. It's also a little bit like TED Talks. And the real TED Talks, you know, like the ones that, the big TED Talks, they vote on like the best idea that's gonna change the world. And that person gets 100 grand. Woohoo, right? By the way, Compassion won one year. That's why I'm in. But, um, so I want to invite your conversation group that you're with to so all that's been said and all that's been heard, name the one best insight or idea that holds the most potential. That one. 
And then, this is kind of a Texas two-step here. What is the one next step you can take as an individual and or as an organization? Those two things might not be the same, by the way, right? So what you think is the very best insight or idea that you've heard in your conversation, that's one decision. But what are you going to do when you walk out tonight? Which may simply involve going home to your child, right? And making a different move than you might have done before. I don't know what that is, but it could be that, right? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass that on to our conversation starters, all said and heard, name the one best insider idea that holds the most potential, and what's the next step that you're going to take as a person or as an organization that you're going to go back or a congregation. Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, from what we talked about, the, the six of us, Alamo Promise is probably the best idea. Um, I'm a big believer in education as an equalizer. Um, and yes, my department, we have a small economic development program, tax increment financing. We've been asked to look at how we can help with that. So I'm gonna go look at the proposal and see what we had in the books and why it could or could not work and figure out um, what we as an organization might be able to do there. Um, but education is a great way to invest in people and it's a great way to equalize um, the uneven playing field. We were talking about some people uh, scoring a home run and it's because they were born on third, you know, like, yeah, I scored. Well, you were born on third base. Um, some people, some of us were not even on the field when we started the game, right? Some of us were not at, at bad. Some of us were not even in the ballpark <laughs> when the game started. So that's one thing. On that theme, I'd like to tell you that it's the top of the second. The Astros are winning two to one. <laughs> I know that because I'm psychic. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously, I do think that you're right that the Alamo Promise is in the early days, but it does have a lot of potential. And I, I want to say that it, it does represent an investing in people. But I'd also like to say that we can't just say this is going to have a big impact on the five community colleges and in isolation they're going to change a lot of things. I can tell you that one thing that works well for our students at St. Philip's College is when we get them out throughout the rest of the city. I've taken students down to the federal courthouse. I've taken students to Trinity. We took, because Trinity has resources and opportunities that are open to the entire city of San Antonio. We're Derek Parfit speak. We brought students from St. Philip's to hear this world-renowned philosopher speak in Laurie Auditorium, and it was fabulous. And so I guess part of it is what I hope is that we as a community recognize the potential of Alamo Promise. Like I said, the mayor, Dr. Flores, they are pushing on this. But we also have to make that come alive. We have to, have to create the partnerships with the other educational institutions, with the health, with the housing, with the government, with every aspect of this to make that come alive to benefit. If the students are going to flourish because of Alamo Promise, we have to realize that's going to be about people and relationships and partnerships in the city. You know, I, I've worked with a lot of at-risk students in underserved communities over the years. And the two big myths were, when they were in high school was, I, I can't go to college. And I'm like, well, what, what is, what's that about? And it was two things. It was, well, I could never get in, and if I could get in, I could never afford it, so it's not even on my radar. Well, I can tell you, Alamo Promise can change that thinking and get people involved. Even if it's the last dollars in, it can be transformative. Um, and hopefully, coming back to the geography piece, um, it'll help our students 
get an education, but also take advantage of the tremendous resources, not just through the Alamo Colleges, but throughout the entire city. Hopefully that's what can happen. I would agree. Uh, Alamo Promise is a great idea now in process. I think that's just the beginning because, um, you know, we work with students through our college and career readiness program, about 100 a year at, at least, and the one thing that's disturbing to me is is when kids leave us and they go on either to community college or a four-year institution, the important thing to me is, are they there the second year? Because I've met too many students who are burdened by the financial aid they receive or qualify for, and it happens at the, it was happening at the community college level, this will help, but particularly at the four-year institutional level, because for me, what's important in terms of the work we do is giving access to choice and to opportunity. That's what you want because people perform at a much higher level, they lead better lives when I made that decision, I had that choice as opposed to the choices being this big. When they're this big, you know, there's just much more there and that ladder for economic segregation or economic opportunity increases. So I think that is the beginning um, because I do see students who are even after the first semester, I said, I had to stop going. I had to get a job. My financial aid package says I gotta make X amount. My parental contribution is X amount. All those things are factors because when you've got, you know, if you're living at home, you know, you've got whether it's um, an internal uh, desire to assist or you're being asked by parents or other uh, adults, well, can you help out a little bit? And maybe you can stop going for a semester. All those things happen all the time. And so now, now you've got students who are now on a six-year program, and that may be okay. Some students can manage that. But, you know, if, when I look at it is, if that student made that choice for the right reason, that's fine. But really, you'd, you'd want people to finish if they could in four years. They're pursuing their dreams two years faster as opposed to delaying their dreams. So I think. Alamo Promise, great idea. It's a good start. We have to do more. I think education is critical. And not just through the Alamo Co College program. I think it should be across the board. Even educating the, the family members. Because when we think about the educational level of just the, the communities, I think too we have to make sure that we capture them just as well from parents and as well as our children. And so um, maybe the expansion of the Alamo College program to other institutions. And really look at the cost of institutions. Should they really be the cost in which they are? I mean, can we look at trying to um, provide other venue, other opportunities to where funding for those schools are not as grand as they are? Um, because I think some of it is really um, escalated beyond really what it costs for the, the education that we're doing. So I think it's important for us to, to really center on pushing the money to the people to where they can be the benefactors of the funding and helping them to be able to, for education, because that has a, a ripple effect and various other things as it pertains to everything in life, I think. I agree with you, um, e even more than Alamo Promise, um, you know, being a communicator, a broadcaster, and being a former ad guy and now a communicator in politics, I'd call it the Make America Read Again program. <laughs> and I'm serious, because if, if you understand that we have a community that isn't reading, they can't get to the Alamo Promise. And, and the community college district shouldn't have to be a remedial school, which it is right now. It is, it is a, a remedial school for our, our big school districts, um, for most students who are at the Alamo College District. Uh, but from my perspective, because I've, I, I have to love everybody, and I do, I genuinely do, um, I have to think about the parents as well as the students, just like you said. and. Um, if we focus on helping America read again, uh, that opens up the ability to discern, decipher, and weave through all of this informational mess we are in. 
and make better decisions and advocate for themselves better, there will be more empowered citizens and economic engines personally. So it, it emanates parents, child, reading, literacy. Um, because I just, I came back from Harvard, we were part of, a, I was part of a group of about 250 leaders from around the country, and it was about American competitiveness and why America is becoming less competitive. And the baby boomers are the last generation that um, literacy was up, numeracy, critical thinking was up. My generation, it's not that way. Uh, our numbers are, are down. So for, for, for a dude like me who's going to be around uh, to see this tension and this, this, this turmoil and this struggle for a lot of our countrymen, um, we got to get busy to help people to, to really understand what it is to thrive in the information technology economy. And literacy is the foundation of it, and we're really missing it in America. Yeah, is, um, and I'm, and I, I, I'm with everybody on, on, on education, Alma Promise. Um, but bringing it, all, bringing it back again to this idea of segregation and, um, and I was telling folks up here, I have, a, I have a problem with that term. Segregation, when it's used in other cities, usually refers to white flight. And, um, but that's not what we have in San Antonio as much, is that we have neighborhoods that were actually created to be poor. They have always been poor, and they have always been, and they were created for non-whites. So we have uneven development, um, more than segregation. But, but what, but to me, it's like what, what the dream would be is like Alma Promise, and yes, not just as remediation, but as higher education, in combination with pride in our communities and in our neighborhoods, you know, so that, so that, that young people can, you know, hopefully remain in the inner city, stabilize some of these inner city neighborhoods and carry on just these fantastic traditions of this city. You know, when, when we advertise the city, it's, a, it's, it's the culture of the inner city neighborhoods that we advertise, right? But we're also, those are, those are the neighborhoods that are most at risk right now of displacement, of gentrification, of the whole deal. And like, how do we do both, right? How do we educate our, our inner city kids and get them to stay, you know? And get them to stay and have pride. And, um, and, that's, and that is, it's like, be proud of where you're from. Be proud of your family, be proud of your neighborhood. And look at this, and I, re I have all of these stories. That to me is like, we have to do both. Well, and by the way, Jefferson, Jefferson, we said, I, at least I think, Jefferson is the inner city neighborhood that has done that the best. We're, 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 you know, where people come back and then they, come, you know, they get, do well and come back and reinvigorate their neighborhood. Alamo Heights, they do it on a different level, but it's not so inner city. <laughs> so, um, these folks are going to maybe start talking about what they're going to do when they leave. Our time to talk this last triad is shorter, so I encourage you to take about two minutes, and you don't have to agree with them, by the way. Maybe you heard another idea or insight, right? Because we want to hear some of those. So um, take about two minutes to kind of decide what you thought was the very best thing. And um, Cynthia and I are going to be passing out bright cards, one to each triad, for you to write that on. And we're going to hear those, but I'd like to get those collected so we don't lose this information. We're also going to hand out little white cards that you can write down and then spend your last eight minutes talking about what you plan to do as an individual and when you leave. Make sense? Okay, two minutes, what you think is the best idea, and then talk about what you're going to do. I already filled out your bright card. I got it. So, if we can come back together. We've heard these folks tell us what they think was the best idea that they've heard tonight. It's not the only one, so we're not going to throw the rest out, but Alamo Promise, it's a good thing. Reading, it's a great thing. Cynthia, what did you just tell me that quote? If you can count? Oh, the quote is by Toni Morrison, and she says, if you can't, if you can't count, they can beat you cheat. if you can't read. I'm sorry. If you can't count, they can cheat you. If you can't read, they can beat you. 
So the bright cards are the ideas that you decided were the best ones, right? Are there any of those ideas that people wanted to share? I've got two microphones with feet. Here's one. Cynthia, do you want to stand up? Somebody come and help her? What's the idea on your bright card? All right, so I work at Sam Ministries right now, um, and one of the ideas actually stems from a meeting I go to every month called the Neighborhood Faith Convening. He actually attends with us. Um, but I was just talking about how community-based um, convenings are so helpful because we can come with needs, we can come with conversations, issues, and work together as nonprofits, as churches, as schools, as um, Senator Menendez's offices come, and we can work together to help solve problems and one of the examples was the city wide reduced bus passes. So that was an initiative that got stemmed um, by a conversation that was had at the convening. One of the board members for VIA was there. He went and took it and now we have it. Um, and so I think it's a way to create tangible change by working together instead of saying like we have this little group doing all of this over here and this group's doing over here. It's increasing conversation so that way we can work smarter not harder and get out of the silos. Yep. It's a great idea. It's six congregations who are partnered with six schools and two neighborhood associations, and they've been doing this for 11 years, meeting once a month. That changes the fabric of community. 15? Yeah. Okay, this hand was up next. Cynthia, you want to walk in here? You got an, an idea to share? Somebody from this side, maybe? Thank okay. you. Hi. Um, wanted to share this, we did. Um, the, our group decided that um, we, we agreed with education equality and equity for all sides of towns. We felt that, or all sides of our town, we felt that every side of town should have an education as good as the north side. Um, and we also agreed that the entire family should be educated. Um, one of the things that we wanted to add is um, a lot of people, like even from the south side, from the east side, Parents move. They go and rent apartments just so their kids can have that north side education. And right now, we've got this huge baby boom of kids. Now, what's going to happen to the north side when all these kids graduate from college and their parents stop renting and they go back home to the south side and to the east side where they're more comfortable and they can afford to live? What's going to happen to all those north siders' incomes, all those schools, that, you know, the, these tax dollars, they're building another school, another school every year. I have friends on the north side that tell me that they can't, they, they can't afford to eat at McDonald's because their taxes are so high and they're always having to pay for another bond or another tax increase. So these are things that we, we as a city have to realize that if we don't educate our south side and we don't educate our east side, then, then we're not going to we're not going to have a successful future in this city. Thank you. We got one over here and one over here. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Nina. I'm a community services specialist with the city of San Antonio, and I work in the Department of Human Services with a new program that's about, well, relatively new. It's about seven months old. It's a youth reengagement program for 16 to 24 year olds. Um, so in doing that, uh, research has told me that a lot of the focus in terms of education is uh, dropout rates are due to surviving. So a lot of people in schools, K through 12, are trying to survive. That's why we have these lunch programs now uh, for students who are out of school. Um, that's a very good example. And so because of that, education is second. So I know a lot of conversation has been on advanced education, meaning college, and that's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing because I suffer from student loans and, and that debt. Um, but going back to my point is I feel like social workers would be really important to have in public schools or in any school. So going to my notes because I'll get off track. Um, going to research saying survival rather than education is the most important in schools. Um, and then also going to Tom, uh, Tommy, Mr. Calvert, uh, Tommy, uh, and also going to Tommy's point in that 25% of adult 
uh, adults in San Antonio uh, suffer from a fifth grade literacy level. Okay, so now what does that tell me? That tells me that we have a whole lot of resources in San Antonio, a lot. I've been, you know, utilizing so many nonprofits and government um, agencies to help the individuals that come through my door. And now that also tells me that there's probably about 30,000 individuals, 16 to 24, who are disconnected from work or school. Now why? Because they're trying to get their basic needs met. And they can't do that on their own. Why? Maybe it's their literacy level. So we have a great thing, sacred.org. That's a internet database that gives us all these resources, and that's great. But if you have a fifth grade literacy level, how is that parent going to access and be able to utilize that internet database? And how are those kids going to be able to utilize resources on their own? So I think social workers in the school would be really beneficial and I've received some reprimand for saying that because it comes down to like funding and public schools and what does that look like and you know so on and so forth but if we're catching it at an early rate well then maybe we don't need so much funding somewhere else like uh, advanced education and getting free college although that's great because I'm a student also um, so our quote here, or what we wrote down, was having inspired, knowledgeable teachers and community supporters in school within early childhood institutions, K through 12. Um, the other thing is I started with Head Start. Um, they've been a federal uh, agency for 50 years. And what's funny is when I uh, went through my family service or family, family support worker credential training, we watched a video that was about 50 years old. And uh, in doing that, I saw that the biggest need within Head Start was transportation. Transportation is always like the barrier for seeking resources and for getting things done and for going to college even and so on and so forth. That's what you mentioned with VIA too. Um, so because of that, I'm thinking, let's say we have social workers in the school. What do schools have? Buses. You know, just right then and there, it's theirs to access, you know, they schedule it, they have the transportation. You have so many parents, so many families in need of certain resources, like food bank, just for example. All right, let's gather a bus of them, let's take them to the food bank, and then we got that there. Um, in addition to uh, that, I feel like exposure is a great thing. Um, so having the challenges that I faced as a student or as a, as a young kid, uh, in fifth grade, and we kind of talked about this, in fifth grade, I saw Incarnate Word. And it was because I passed by. And I had a very challenged upbringing. Um, I was homeless at the age of 16. And I navigated my way through. I graduated from Incarnate Word. I'm currently in the master's program for Incarnate Word. And it all came down, thank you. And it all came down from exposure. I saw Incarnate Word and I said, I'm going to go there. I set the goal for myself and then I continued on. I feel like there's this uh, program that I've spoken uh, with uh, Dr. Gonzalez about who's at the Civic, uh, the Edling Center for Civic Leadership at Incarnate Word. And we've talked about having a day in the life of a college student and what that one exposure does. And that's something a social worker can coordinate and get people signed up for to do that and to give them that exposure. So. Yeah, uh, that's what it comes down to for me. I think that's really important to have because teachers cannot do it all. And school counselors cannot do it all. They're focused on academics. Teachers are focused on teaching the criteria that those kids need to know. And social workers can focus on all the basic needs. So thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more because we have a commitment to ending on time as well. <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, I'd like to think about is shifting from an either or mm. mentality to a both and mentality. We can do more than one thing at one time. We can deal with food anxiety and we can deal with education all at the same time. Mm -hmm. We can do those things because they're all interrelated. And one of the things that uh, my compatriot here and I came up with is that as we deal with the education of young people, we cannot ignore their parents, 
because their parents are the ones who inspire them. Their parents are the ones who encourage them. Their parents are the ones who provide an atmosphere in which they can learn and grow. And if their parents don't have an appreciation for education and, a, and an avenue by which they can increase their own ability to increase their own appreciation for education, then what happens is that child's or that young person's road to education becomes depressed. So we, we're, we're, our pro, uh, program was increased reading comprehension both for children and adults so that they can be dealt with. Thank you. So I'm wondering if you folks would be willing to share what you plan to do when you leave tonight. So if I can get the microphones back. Yourself or your organization, an effort. Did you come to that part? Sure, I will just uh, pick up on what you were saying about the inspiration, which is I decided I would take some of my students from St. Philip's College and contact friends and colleagues that I have at Incarnate Word and at Trinity and St. Mary's and literally get them from our side of town to their side of town. And, uh, and again, hopefully help them see the links and inspire them to keep thinking about their own future. Wow, yay. We have a program uh, that's called the Bishop Jones Scholars Ambassadors Program where we support students in college, both two-year and four-year. And uh, it's, it's limited in terms of what we can do, but it's very um, substantial in terms of the support that it can offer. And uh, one of those graduates uh, left for college, went to Notre Dame, came back, is now an architect, uh, serves on our board. And he's one of the many, many, I think, success stories. And I said, I wish you could make it bigger. You know, right now we serve a limited number, but obviously the need is greater than that because when you look at what uh, Jerry is doing, and there's many other, you know, Jerry's out there, um, you know, having a, a, a loan forgiveness or a loan, a grant, uh, something that, you know, you can kind of give back and, I'm thinking of an AmeriCorps type program, you know, come back and work with us for a year or two and, and kind of show what, what has you been transformed and help us continue to transform. So um, that's brewing right now. Uh, one of the things that I had identified to take away from here is to identify strategies to help promote higher education and or education across the board to be inclusive of the entire family because I think it's key that our children are looking to, our par to their parents in order to get that encouragement and even just the support to do that in it and if they don't have that. And I think that the social worker, I think that's a great opportunity and someone who can build that relationship with adults because after a certain age, we have a tendency of, of shame to identify where we are in our educational level. So to be able to open them up, to get them to be able to let you know that they have a fifth grade education or less, that's, that's crucial. And so in order for us to break through those barriers that they have, it's, that's important in order to even get to the point of trying to help to provide resources for them for education. So I think it's crucial in a sense of being able, to, for me, to be able to go out. How do we find those resources that are available that we can recommend to the community, to the families, to help them to, to be able to feel comfortable in letting folks help them and that it's okay? So for me, I'm gonna ground it back in family and, and the work I do. So of course, I'm gonna tell my kids the story of what I did this evening. Uh, and why this conversation matters. Um, even though they're growing with a little bit more privilege than I grew up with, I, I want them to have the same kind of empathy um, that I see my mom instilled in, in me and my siblings. So having that conversation with them and making sure that they know why we're supposed to treat people the same and with 
dignity and respect and kindness with them. And then the same conversation with my coworkers, that our work is important because we make a difference in people's lives. And no matter where someone in, is in, in, in station, um, in, in their life stage or their economic uh, level, that they too um, need this kindness and respect and dignity. And, and so our job is to deliver. We're here to serve. And so we have to serve them to the best of our ability and continue to instill that in our staff team for all the programs. And then in line with that, treating people with dignity and respect is also communicating. Um, so communicating with our clients about what we do, why we do it, uh, why it matters, but also communicating with the wider community about what else we need to do. And so that's, that's something I'll, I'll take. And it's not going to be immediate but there'll be communication about here are the big things as a community that we need to do. Thank you. Christine? Sure. I, um, so I'm, I'm a researcher. And, um, and just like we, um, as a city, um, have had this conversation for the last couple of years about equity and have taken the time to understand and to look into the history of what got us into this situation so that we can begin to change it. Um, and that resulted in the equity budget and all of that, which is baby step, baby step. But at least we're, we're now aware and we're here. Um, and we're concerned. And that's kind of where, where I, that's where I can make a contribution is in, is in kind of do, doing the, the grunt work behind the scenes about how did we get in this situation in the first place? Because I truly believe that if, unless we understand how we got here, we can't fix it. Right? We're, and then we're just working at the surface and trying to make ourselves feel good. We have to understand. And, and I mentioned this a little bit recently, or a second ago, that, that I want to push this conversation out of just talking about segregation because that's often... When we talk about segregation, it often ends up to be a, a, a thing about individuals. I want to shift that conversation more into uneven development. Tommy used the word apartheid, right? Um, and even just like, you know, when we think about the development patterns in this city, it's much more like a colonial type pattern that you would see in, in Mexico in the, on the border than just like a segregation thing. And, mm. and, so if I've, and that's what I'm determined to do, is continue to do their research, continue to, like, to try to get that out in a variety of forms, in the public media, in, the, in a research type way, so that we can start to move in a more meaningful way. Well, uh, let me thank Reverend Ann for this conversation. Uh, this, uh, give her a big round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very selfish thing. I well, just really revel in that. Well, uh, you know, I want to thank you because I definitely uh, feel as if this was uh, meaningful for me. Uh, you know, I get invited to talk and speak at a lot of things, but this was not for not. This, this was, I think we made an impact today. I think we have some ripples that are going to happen today. Um, I was, I was hoping, Doc, that you would take me to school on the things going on with Saha because we didn't even get into that today because I think that's all that's, kind of messed up. That's the next question. That's all kind of messed up. <laughs> but maybe we could do a Skype conversation and, and then people can Skype in and do something of that, that nature. So, uh, you know, part of the, uh, the, the debt that I owe for being a public servant is I don't have the liberty of doing just one thing. <laughs> I have to tackle what's on everybody's plate. And, uh, you know, we're strategic about it. We, we, are, uh, we don't fight all the battles all at once. <clears throat> but uh, so you ask me what, what, what one thing I'm going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with pastor here. I'm not going to confine myself to one thing. But um, in being what I, I kind of call myself a Jedi <laughs> of, of uh, politics, um, I'm going to pray, work, and win. That's what I'm going to do from here. Thank you. So before I thank you all for coming tonight, um, what you might want to do if you haven't done so already is to watch um, Christine's video, right?
And the easiest way for you to do that, I don't have it written down, but if you Google the faith-based initiative, City of San Antonio, you get to the landing page and it's right there and Charlotte Ann did a wonderful production of that. You'll also see another video there from SA 2020 and Molly Cox and the Impact Report. So both of those go hand in hand. So if you haven't done that, I highly recommend that as the next step. Um, one of the things that I heard that I just, critical thinking skills, Christine, I was listening to you, but there are two basic steps with compassion, two really simple steps, and what brings us here tonight is our effort to be a more compassionate city, but it's awareness and agency, knowing and also knowing that you can do something. That you have a sense of action. That's, it's really that simple. So it does take us from bystander to upstander. Right? So um, I am going to show you the dates of the upcoming conversations. I do not know where they are because we like to move them around the city. Um, they were think the, the titles may change, but this is where we're headed, we think. Um, so you might want to write those down. I think we're going to have them all in the evenings now, 6.30 to 8.30, just like this. So if you want to mark your calendars. Um, when you leave, if you have one of the bright color cards, if you would put them in that big glass bowl and take out like some crackers or raisins or something, so I'm not taking that home and eating that all up. So drop the bright colored cards in there. That would be awesome. The white cards go home and they go in your refrigerator so you don't forget. Um, thank you for being here this evening. Be safe going home. We'll send you the results by email. So start watching.